the, the district attorney's office has notified me this morning that they have the um, entire program on a, uh, it looks like a hard drive terabyte that they're willing to uh, put into evidence uh, so it will be part of the record. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is go ahead and let you take a look at it. Um, we've got it, I guess, on a uh, separate terabyte, so we could have a few minutes. Mr. Rodriguez can put that up. Uh, Your Honor, based on the, the motion, just to let you know where we're going today, we actually have several motions. Uh, the state's filed, I think, about uh, seven or so. Two of those are going to be withdrawn uh, once we get it done with these uh, witness related motions. Uh, just so you're aware, uh, Mr. Evans has a, a, a jury out, so if for some reason they get a verdict or something like that, we would ask to just pause if he's handling a witness uh, and then move on to the other motions that I'll be handling today, if that's okay. Um, regarding motion 21, and it will be relevant probably to uh, motion 22, uh, the, I know for the purposes of laying the foundation for the admissibility of these materials, the defense is seeking to exclude. The burden would be on the state to lay certain factors so what we intend on doing, we actually already have the, the computer and the uh, items queued up. And so what we'd ask is just to, since it's our burden, go ahead and call our witnesses to, uh, from an evidentiary standpoint, to lay the foundation of the defense uh, can play whatever they want through uh, the witness to, if they want to point something out that they specifically think is improper. Y'all with that? Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, the bottom line is you, you need to see it. So I'm, I'm okay with procedurally doing it that way. And I'm ready to do Okay. All right, then that will call the text bill slider for the meeting. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And just for our record, you are the next in the case of the state of Georgia versus Justin Ross Harris. Correct? I am. You're aware of the subject matter of these two particular motions that have been filed by the defense, one involving uh, some standing and one involving a uh, man as well. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. All right. And they kind of uh, dovetail off of each other in that some of the scans in question actually include the man being placed in a car seat. Is that accurate? That is also accurate. So it lays some background for the authentic of these scans. Um, first of all, will you explain for the record and to the court, did you respond to the scene of the uh, uh, death in this particular case of Cooper Harris? I did. Um, 18th of October, June 2014, about 16, 23 hours. That'd be about 4, 23 p.m. I did respond um, to Acres Mill Road um, outside of Mandio's Pizza um, to the death scene of a child. And did you have an opportunity to yourself actually observe Cooper Harris in the condition of his body at any point? I have. Okay. And um, did you attend the autopsy by chance? I did. Okay. And during the autopsy, there were certain measurements that were taken of Cooper Harris. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Those uh, measurements were provided to you uh, via the medical examiner's office, and you have a copy of the medical examiner's report, correct? I do. At some point during the preparation of this case uh, for court, uh, we, the state and Cobb County Police Department, made arrangements to have a life-size mannequin of Cooper Harris created. Is that correct? That is correct. And having viewed Cooper Harris himself, uh, the decedent, and having viewed the mannequin, can you confirm for our record, are they the same size and have the same or similar appearance? Yes. Part of the reason for doing that was was what? What did we want to do in terms of the scanning and in terms of the car seat? What was the purpose? 
one person would be able to sit there and we could show where the child would have been in the car seat in regards to everything else inside the vehicle. Okay. Um, there are several scans in question. You've already talked about one scene, which is Little Matteo's, uh, where the defendant's vehicle and Cooper Harris were located when you were initially dispatched, correct? Correct. At some point, were you also interested in viewing a different scene, defendant's workplace? That is correct. Can you please describe for the court where it is that the defendant worked and what particular area of that workplace was of interest to you? Um, the defendant worked at the Treehouse Complex. It's 2600 Cumberland um, Parkway. Um, we were interested in the parking lot and especially the one parking space that um, Mr. Harris had parked that morning. Was there any video uh, evidence that was recovered from Home Depot that showed that parking lot area? Yes, there was surveillance video of the parking lot. Have you had an opportunity to review that video? I have. At some point during that review of the video, did you see defendant's vehicle parked uh, in that parking lot? That's correct. Just describe for our record where generally it was observed um, parked. It was parked in the parking lot on the same side of the door, um, the main entrance to the building, and it was parked towards the back, the second to last row of the parking lot. Having uh, watched that video, did you watch it uh, throughout the day to see if there was any activity surrounding the vehicle? I did. Did you see any activity? I did see activity. Describe. That afternoon, um, I saw a vehicle pull up to the vehicle, up to, I saw a car pull up to the Hyundai at 1241, 42 hours, um, Mr. Harris returns to his parked vehicle. He gets out of his friend's vehicle. He walks up to the door. 1242, 12, he opens the driver's side door. He walks into the frame. He throws a bag of light bulbs we found out later into the vehicle. His head stays above the car. He backs off, he shuts the door, and then he walks into the treehouse complex. With the door open, you could actually see the defendant within the door frame of the vehicle? That's correct. When the door is open, he walks into the frame and his arms actually enter the vehicle and throw the bag in. Yes, sir. Okay. Let me just authenticate these photographs and then judge with your permission, I'll step out and go take that verdict downstairs and return. Yes. Um, should defense counsel first. Detective Stoddard, I'm going to show you states one through five. Looking at states one through five, do you recognize these as being fair and accurate depictions? of still frames that were captured from the video that you obtained from Home Depot that you had just referenced. I do. And um, to, to be clear, these are enhanced in that they're, we have asked for a, a technician to be able to focus in a little close, more closely on, on that. Um, that is correct. Uh, other than zooming in mm -hmm. on those, these are fair and accurate depictions of what you saw on the video itself. That is correct. Tender one through five. Judge. Right, judge with that. To the appropriate report, take a call to take the verdict, and I'll be at this. And it's the court will release you. Dr. Glenn, I'll excuse you. Um, is there something else that can be done? Uh, yes, Your Honor. We have several uh, motions of state's file we can handle, and if we still need to, the defense has some other motions as well that do not require with us. Okay. Well, let's do that. Um, also, uh, uh, we're in the <coughs> afternoon, so we don't have to be on the gun, uh, except the, the uh, peer review of the mental health court is going to have um, their response to the team at about 2.30. So I will take a break for that. But uh, my hope is that we want to finish the sale. I should um, need to go to the court that I don't think will be reasonable. And I cancel that so we can take more normal course. I will say it. I'm not sick. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Stop making that now. Yeah, that works. Thank you. Thank you. What are we uh, Your Honor, just looking at the motions the state has filed, um, two of the motions that you, you have, the state is uh, withdrawing. Uh, one, as you might expect, we have filed a motion to uh, take the jury to the actual uh, scene of the incidents. Since we will be trying this case in Brunswick, we do not intend to ask the court to bus jurors back up here to the crime scene. Okay. Uh, 
And that's going to be one of the reasons why we are intending to show this demonstrative evidence that Mr. Evans is going to talk about, because it would be much more easy, we believe, to do it that way. Uh, also, there is a motion uh, to compel uh, regarding Dr. Matches, a, an expert of the defense. Uh, this defense actually remedied the issue that we had, so we would be withdrawing that motion as well. Uh, Your Honor, we have um, just uh, provided the defense with some case law that we'll be talking about today. We need your honor copy and the court reporter. Um, the first motion we have, Your Honor, you may have up there is uh, to hear right now would be the motion to compel uh, production of defendant's statement. Uh, just to explain this motion a little bit, uh, <clears throat> this motion is filed basically uh, requesting this statement by the defendant be turned over pursuant to 17167 uh, and 247705. Uh, just procedurally, uh, sorry, uh, Your Honor, I don't believe that one is numbered. It was filed on the 11th of April, 2016. It's the first one in the binder. It, it's the first one that I have, Judge. Okay. Um, in that, uh, <clears throat> the binder you have, the binder is actually separated uh, by topics, I believe, as well in there. Um, but the, this is just going to be this motion, merely talking statutory scheme anyway. So I'll be signing 17, 16, 7, and 24, 7, 7, 0, 5. Um, just procedurally, what I'm talking about, Judge, is that on the 6th of April, 2016, uh, the days before we started jury selection, we received discovery from the defense in this case with several witness statements, names, and things of that nature. Uh, one of the witnesses we received a name for would be uh, expert David Dime, Dr. David Diamond. Uh, I received the expert summary on that day, and then I called Dr. Diamond and spoke to him about the case. Uh, while speaking to him, he told me briefly some of the details of what he I was going to consider as far as forming his opinion, and in the midst of that, uh, disclosed to me that he had actually interviewed the defendant as well uh, regarding his statement. Uh, also, he said that in his opinion, he was going to be relying on the defendant's statement that he made to him. And to tell you the truth, Judge, I had no idea when this statement was made to Dr. Diamond, but it was sometime after June 18, 2014. Um, I have no idea about when it was because Dr. Diamond did tell me that he had memorialized it in a, a written form. Uh, however, Dr. Diamond would not send me uh, his documentation of his statement regarding the interview with the defendant. So uh, at that point, um, I, I sent emails requesting this from the defense in that I knew that there were statements of their witness, Dr. Diamond, statements that he intended to rely on. Um, I have not received this statement or this written documentation from the expert. Uh, the reasons why this should be compelled, Judge, first, it's, this is very simple. It's uh, pursuant to OCGA 17167. Uh, it's simple, as simple as just looking at the statute requiring a defendant to turn over, defense to turn over statements of witnesses. <clears throat> the statute holds that the defendant shall produce any statement of any witness that is in the possession, custody, or control of the defense counsel that relates to the subject matter concerning the testimony of the witness that the party in possession intends to call as a witness. Uh, in this case, Dr. Diamond was provided as a witness the defense intends to call. His statement, as he talked to me about it, uh, stated that it was something that he prepared, that he wrote, documentation that contained information he intends to testify about. So clearly, this is something that is required to be test, uh, turned over by the defense as it is a statement of Dr. Diamond, a witness in their case. Uh, and further, just as uh, for a, another reason, if that's not simple enough, uh, OCGA 247705 uh, would necessitate turning this over. Under this statute, a defendant is required to disclose underlying facts and data related to his testimony on cross-examination. Uh, Judge, we've already filed motions to exclude these self-serving statements, and we'll get to that later. Uh, I'm sure you've handled plenty of those um, over the years, but we, <coughs> we've filed a motion to exclude a self-serving statement knowing that it exists, knowing that it would be self-serving, but we haven't even read it yet. Uh, in order to properly cross-examine a defendant, uh, a defense witness, uh, we would need that statement. Uh, I cited to United States versus, and I'm going to take a shot at pronouncing this, Diakumpa, it's D-I-A-K-H-E-O-U-M-P-A, it's 2016, United States District, Lexus, 36209. Uh, that's from the Southern District of New York in March of this year. In that case, the court ordered uh, pretrial disclosure uh, of the, a statement or statements and things that were data that the expert relied on 
in order to allow the state to prepare a meaningful cross-examination. And they cited the advisory notes from the federal rules of evidence, which our rules of evidence mirror in this regard. Uh, so, Judge, basically what I'm asking is that the defense provide the statement which is clearly uh, required under 17.6.7 and also that you further order they turn that over under 24.7.705 so that we would have a meaningful cross-examination of Dr. Diamond as well. Judge, we turned over everything that there is to turn over, certainly everything that we're required to turn over. Take a look at the state's written motion, paragraph three. It says that the state spoke with Dr. Diamond via telephone on April 6, 2016. During that conversation, Dr. Diamond disclosed that he had created written documentation regarding the statement the defendant gave him during his work on the case. If, um, if Dr. Diamond had said that he uh, had a recorded statement or had a uh, um, written statement from uh, Mr. Harris, that would be in the written motion. The reason why it's not in there is it doesn't exist. I, I wasn't privy to any conversation that Mr. Boring had with the witness. Um, but what is in their written motion is pretty clear. Dr. Diamond apparently told him he had some notes. That's work product. What the what the what is required is <clears throat> excuse me, what is required that the defendant disclose 17164. Just look at the discovery statute, B2. Defendant's got to turn over a report of any physical or mental examinations and of scientific tests or experiments, including a summary of the basis for the expert opinion rendered in the report or copies thereof. <clears throat> if the defendant intends to introduce in evidence in the defense's case in chief or rebuttal the results of the physical or mental examination or scientific test or experiment, if the report is oral or partially oral, the defendant shall reduce all relevant material oral portions of such report to a writing. Well, what we have turned over is what is required, and that is we gave the defense a summary of what, um, what we believe Dr. Diamond's opinions uh, will be and what he's going to base his opinions on. We also turned over a PowerPoint that um, Dr. Diamond may or may not use if he testifies at trial. More importantly, the state has interviewed the witness. If there is some particular statements um, uh, out there, they, they interviewed Dr. Diamond. They could very directly ask him, well, what statements? What did he tell you? <clears throat> there is no... Um, the, there is no statement that was given to a witness that was recorded in any fashion. Take a look at the statute they're relying on, 17167. Well, what does it require? Well, it requires that the defendant shall produce for the opposing party any statement of any witness that is in its possession. Okay, well, we don't have anything like that. Um, the, fact that a, uh, the fact that a witness may be taking some notes about anything and everything about what he's doing, that's, that's work product, Judge. That's not something that we're required to turn over. <coughs> Excuse me. Take a look at a case on this issue, um, Forehand versus the State, 267 Georgia, 254, 1996 case. Forehand urges that the identification testimony of an eyewitness was inadmissible because the State did not comply with 17167. The statutory obligation is not triggered when a witness merely makes an oral statement. There can be no possession, custody, or control of a witness's statement which has neither been recorded nor committed to writing. If the, um, if the expert has notes about his communications with us, if he has notes about um, his review of um, all of the materials 
including anything he talked to um, the uh, defendant about, those are just his notes. That's not a statement of any witness that has been reduced to a writing. So uh, we've turned over what there is to turn over. We've turned over what we're required to turn over. Uh, and to the extent that um, there's a suggestion that somehow there is a, a recorded statement in some form, um, I think Mr. Boring simply needs to talk to Dr. Diamond again. That's the remedy. Well, Judge, first I'll point out they didn't even talk about 24-7-705, which gives you the discretion to order it because it is something that in their own summary, and per Mr. Diamond, he relied on this interview with the defendant to come to his uh, opinion or conclusion that he intends to give, or several uh, conclusions. Uh, when Mr. Kilgore was talking or reading that case beforehand, he talked about, and beforehand talked about, statutory, it's not required statutorily to be turned over if it's oral. However, if he puts it in writing, which Dr. Diamond said he did, in which the defense has not said they do not possess this writing or notes of the defendant, it should be turned over. I'm not asking for this doctor's discussions or notes when talking with the defense. I'm not asking for his notes about other things like that. I, that. I'm asking about written documentation, his statement, not only his statement, but the statement of the defendant in this case, which he has taken and is going to rely on in his testimony. Um, he flat out told me he has it, and he wasn't going to give it to me, and I'd have to talk to the defense. So, uh, Your Honor, I believe he's required to turn it over to the defenses per 17, 16, 7, and uh, with your discretion under 24, 7, 7, 0, 5. Well, I'm going to write the motion at least be crafted along the lines of... Uh, any writing that the doctor has memorializing the conversation or discussion he had with the defendant is to be um, discussed. And if he says he doesn't have anything, then we're going to bring him in here and take testimony. We understand that. Thank you. Your Honor, the next motion the state would argue. Um, it's a pretty straightforward one. This would be a motion in limine to exclude self-serving statements of the defendant. Um, talking about two things, it's kind of hard to argue. I, I think at this point, um, I would, I'm gonna, we're going to have to assume, and my argument is going to be assuming that the defendant's statement to Dr. Diamond would be self-serving and would be a statement that the state would not intend to introduce, but that the defense may try to later on. Um, just for uh, purposes of this motion as well, um, what we're seeking to do is exclude any statement the defendant made post-arrest offered by the defendant himself that would be nothing more than hearsay without exception. So the state's seeking to exclude those statements. In this case, those statements are the one that we haven't been provided by Dr. Diamond yet, uh, but also uh, statements made by the defendant to a Dr. Agarkar, and I'm going to have to uh, spell that as well, as A-G-H-A-R-K-A-R. Um, this is another expert the defense provided on April the 6th, 2016. Uh, we learned that he had made a statement to this doctor, uh, and it appears, per the notes, that this doctor actually did for me. He provided me a one-page uh, of handwritten notes from a conversation with the defendant that took place and for about an hour and 45 minutes, about 20 months after the incident, uh, on February the 9th, 2016. Um, I'm sure, Your Honor, we've had motions like this time and time again um, regarding, and it's more uh, of just trying to head it off at the past before we get too late because of the, we do a pretrial so it doesn't come out inadvertently or inappropriately in opening or closing statement, or opening statement. Um, the statements are and should be excluded uh, pursuant to 801C as they are hearsay. 801C says that statements offered for the truth of the matter asserted uh, are hearsay other than ones made while the defendant is testifying. Uh, even where a defendant testifies at trial and subjects himself to cross-examination, self-serving statements are even still admissible. Whereas it used to be, I think, and we just say, well, the defendant testified, you know what, he's subject to cross-examination, all the statements are coming in, this witness, all the statements are coming in. That's not the law now. Even when a defendant testifies in his own behalf, unless there is some other exception, his other self-serving statements, not offered by the party opponent, are inadmissible. 
Your Honor, the case I would turn your attention to would be United States v. Bradley. That case, Judge, it's about 75 pages long, so I'm not going to ask you to read the whole opinion there. But I will point you to the page where the discussion starts, page 45 in that decision. That is in the self-serving hearsay tab. So about page 45 is where Bradley starts to discuss this issue. This is an 11th Circuit case, Judge. The site is 644 Federal 3rd, 1213. That's an 11th Circuit case, 2011. The defendant in that case attempted to introduce his own statements that he had previously made while testifying at trial. He tried to find several exceptions for this, and the court properly held that these statements were inadmissible. They were self-serving hearsay, as they were not offered by the party opponent. They were offered by the defendant himself, and they were not admissible. So, Your Honor, we're asking to exclude this because we believe the law and the principles, while we have a new code, even under federal law, it is clear that statements offered by the defendant himself after the crime to try to support his defense are not admissible unless he takes the stand and there is some other exception. Additionally, Your Honor, under 403, that's one of the reasons we are asking that it be heard now to deal with this. Cite State v. Harvey v. State 296823 just to illustrate what can happen when this is violated. In that case, there was a pretrial motion, and the defense mentioned a statement, a self-serving statement that the defendant made, a statement that the state was not intending to introduce. And unfortunately, a mistrial in a murder case was caused because of that. So, Your Honor, I believe that we filed this motion now, even though the law is clear on this, to exclude these statements until and if there is some exception that arises or if the state chooses to use it to cross-examine a witness or the defendant himself. Under the new rules, Judge, there is no more recognition of self-serving statements. That's gone. Federal rules simply apply the hearsay rules to any alleged out-of-court statement. We know that the state has interviewed both of these witnesses they're concerned about. They've had an opportunity to question them about whatever it was they based their opinion on, including any communications with Mr. Harris. Yet they put no statements whatsoever in the written motion, nor do they tell you of any particular statements that, for whatever reason, they don't want to come out or they don't want the jury to hear. I think this motion is premature. Should there come a point in time where a witness gives what the state may contend is hearsay testimony, well, that would be a point in time in which they would object. And then we would take it up to determine, is it in fact hearsay? Is it non-hearsay? Is there an exception? But to just come before the court and say anything, any statements whatsoever that the defendant may have made to either of these witnesses, that's hearsay and there can be no reference to it whatsoever. Well, we know that's not the law. We know as a practical matter, we hear this all the time. Think about all the cases where mental health experts testify and they go into great detail about what the defendant told them. We have that all the time. There are all kinds of reasons why these sort of out-of-court statements are either non-hearsay or there's an exception. So let me point out also, according to the state, they have received a written statement of whatever statements that were made to Dr. Agarkar. They have it. Yet they don't point out to, in their motion, either before the court or in writing, they point to not one single statement that they're objecting to. Excuse me. So at this point in time, Judge, I don't think there's anything for you to rule on. I think we've got to wait and see if there is in fact any hearsay 
that the state alleges at the time uh, of trial. If it is, they can object. We'll deal with it then. Judge, just briefly, <clears throat> the statements I would be uh, objecting to would be any statements made almost two years after the incident, after the review of all the discovery in the case, uh, about what actually happened that day. Those would be statements to these uh, alleged experts. Uh, Mr. Kilgore talks about mental health cases. Those are cases where you have a mental health defense, where somebody is seeking to say that they are insane or not and may have admitted the act or something like that. We don't have that in this case. There is no mental health defense in this case. Judge, they decided no exception for these statements provided to these experts whatsoever. The case I cited is actually a federal case uh, which, which refers to and applies the federal rules of evidence, which again and again we have been instructed we need to follow that need to follow the instructions of the Supreme Court as well that we don't apply the old cases. We apply cases interpreting something similar to the federal rules or the federal rules. So I think the Bradley case is clear, and I think that because of the, the possibility of, of mentioning an opening statement about it, some statement of the defendant, self-serving, made years later, uh, being, that's inadmissible in the long run, that you should exclude it now. And if somehow, for these purposes, if they come up with an exception later and they find and lay the foundation, okay, we have a hearsay exception for this statement or that statement, well then we'll approach it at that time. But at this time, uh, any statement that the state is seeking to exclude regarding the defendant telling people what happened that day years later should be ex excluded clearly under Bradley. <clears throat> We want to grant the motion um, in a limited way. It's granted at this time. Uh, any of these statements are not to be brought up um, to the jury at any time until the defense is uh, at a posture in the evidence, in their opinion, to move the court to reconsider um, or consider, might be the more appropriate way, the content of um, these statements and the reasoning uh, behind why they admitted that needs to be done outside the presence of the jury. It can be done in the nature of a proper. Um, you just need to let them know when you think it's appropriate how to do that. Uh, and then I'll decide in the course of the trial when we'll take it up. So in a limited fashion, I grant the motion. Thank you, Arnold. Next. Next uh, motion we have, Judge, is a motion in limiting to exclude uh, improper testimony on the ultimate issue. Um, this is regarding Dr. Diamond, Judge. We uh, received a, an expert summary about what Dr. Diamond would be uh, seeking to testify about. Uh, and we're not seeking to exclude his testimony in whole. It's one particular issue that he, via speaking to him and via the defense's expert summary, uh, would be an improper opinion. Um, he, it alleges that he is going to testify about brain function and memory and things like that. Uh, that may be relevant to this case. We're not seeking at this time to exclude any of that testimony. Uh, what we are seeking to do is to exclude uh, testimony about the ultimate issue by an expert in this case. Um, I'm not to say that there won't be more objections that arise as the doctor testifies and things like that, but today uh, we believe that the statement that he makes in the summary provided by the defense is so clearly a violation of our rules of evidence that we need to make a motion to exclude it at this point. Um, the expert opinion that the, this expert would intend to give would be as to intent and say that based on his review of uh, looking at statements and talking to the defendant and going to the scene and things like that, he wants to give an opinion that he uh, does not think that it was intentional, but it was a failure of memory systems. Uh, Dr. Diamond uh, testifies about this issue a lot all over the country, uh, and while he may have some information regarding memory and brain systems, uh, his testimony as to the intent of the defendant is completely excludable. Uh, first of all, under the new evidence code, uh, Rule 247704B clearly states that this type of evidence is inadmissible. That statute holds that uh, and states that no expert witness testifying with respect to the mental state or condition of an accused in a criminal proceeding shall state an opinion or inference as to whether the accused did or did not have the mental state or condition constituting an element of the crime charge or a defense thereto. Such ultimate issues are matters for the trial of fact alone. 
Judge, this specifically says that the, an expert cannot give testimony about the mental state of condition that constitutes an element of the crime. Um, I've cited uh, U.S. versus Cowan as well. It's 2012 U.S. Appeals, Lexus 23687. That's an 11th Circuit case, 2012. Uh, it holds that any testimony regarding or concerning the mens rea of a criminal defendant is inadmissible as well, not just with an expert, but with any witness. And having an expert talk about that gives it even more, it makes it even more of a problem. Um, Judge Clay, Clayton County versus Seagrest, S-E-G-R-E-S-T, that's 333, Georgia Appeals 85. It's a 2015 case. That actually is a Georgia case applying the new evidence code. Um, the court held there that an expert may not merely tell the jury what result to reach and may not testify to the legal implications of their conduct. Uh, in this case, the expert is trying to be able to opine as an expert that the, uh, the acts were not intentional and that he is not guilty of intending to kill his child. Uh, in Clayton, the expert was improperly allowed to testify that the party acted, quote, in reckless disregard of a standard. Uh, also in that case, in footnote five, they noted specifically that there is an exception to actually allowing ultimate issue testimony. As you know, Judge, sometimes ultimate issue testimony under the new code is allowable. However, they point out that 704B specifically says, no, it is not allowed um, as to testimony regarding the defendant's mental state regarding an element of the crime. Specifically here, that's what Dr. Diamond in that statement in the expert witness summary provided uh, is going to be asked to do. Uh, so, Your Honor, at this point, I would ask you uh, to exclude the defense expert from attempting to give any opinion as to an element of the crime or whether the defendant's uh, mental state was something of intentional act, uh, negligence, or anything of that nature. <clears throat> just because it embraces the ultimate issue. Part B goes on to say, in a criminal case, an expert witness must not state an opinion about whether the defendant did or did not have a mental state or condition that constitutes an element of the crime charge or of a defense. Our rule, 24-7-704, similarly worded, except as provided in subsection B of this code section, testimony in the form of an opinion or inference otherwise admissible shall not be objectionable because it embraces an ultimate issue to be decided by the trier of fact. No expert witness testifying with regard to the mental state or condition of an accused in a criminal proceeding shall state an opinion or inference as to whether the accused did or did not have the mental state or condition constituting an element of the crime charged or of a defense thereto. Such ultimate issues are matters for the trier of fact alone. So we took a look at, uh, you know, what this means under the, uh, the new code section. And so we went to the, uh, to the prosecutor's Bible, um, Carlson on evidence. You know, we go through that section just briefly with the court and um, let you know what Carlson says about this. Fourth edition, I'm on page, um, starting on page 464. Congress designed this rule that we're talking about, 704B, to ensure that juries, not experts, make the final determination on the issue of insanity. It goes on to talk about, um, talk about that that was that's the basis of this rule. Really, it's, it's, 
its roots are in not wanting uh, doctors to come in to mental health cases and say, uh, give the ultimate opinion that he, he's not guilty by reason of insanity. 704 was not created to limit the flow of diagnostic and clinical information. Every fact, every actual fact concerning the defendant's mental condition is admissible. In short, the rule forbids only conclusions as to the ultimate legal issue to be found by the trier fact. That's quoting United States versus Edwards. Um, rule 704B bars an opinion on the ultimate legal issue but the prohibition does not exclude all mental testimony. It states, uh, it states uh, U.S. versus Augustine, 661 F. 3rd, uh, 1105, a 2011 11th Circuit Court decision. Rule 704 does not require exclusion of expert proof that supports an inference with respect to the defendant's state of mind. This is all coming from this is all coming from the prosecution handbook, Judge. This is all coming from Carlson. You, uh, it cites U.S. versus Finley, 301 F. 3rd, 1000. That's a Ninth Circuit decision. 704B allows expert testimony, which is focused upon the defendant's mental state, so long as the expert does not draw the ultimate legal conclusion for the jury. I'm on page 466. Uh, citing United States versus Schneider, 704 F. 3rd, 1287. That's a Tenth Circuit decision from 2013. Rule 704 does not prevent an expert from drawing conclusions about intent, so long as the expert does not profess to know a defendant's intent. So that's what um, that's what the uh, essentially the prosecutor's handbook tells us about this rule. So let's look at what, let's look at an opinion. <clears throat> United States versus Alvarez, uh, 837 F. 3rd, 10, 1024, the 1988 decision. It's the same language. Operative language of 704B says that an expert may not state an opinion or inference as to whether or not whether the defendant did or did not have the mental state or condition constituting an element of the crime charge or defense thereto. This means that the expert cannot expressly state a conclusion that the defendant did or did not have the requisite intent. <clears throat> um, curiously, the the, the case cited in the state's motion, in par paragraph six, State versus Cowan. Um, I'm assuming the court's been provided a copy of that. Well, that's a first of all, that's a non-published opinion, um, and what it's cited for is absolute dicta. That, that there's nothing at all in that opinion whatsoever that has anything to do uh, about an expert testifying to the defendant's mental state. Nothing. Nothing at all. <clears throat> so, knowing that that's the law, we um, we will be very sure to um, tell not just Dr. Diamond, but any anybody, any expert that's called to testify for us that they cannot give testimony to the ultimate issue as prohibited by the law. They can't get up there and say he's not guilty. They can't give an opinion that he did not act with malice. They can't give an opinion that there was no criminal negligence. They cannot give an opinion that it was not intentional. They can't give an opinion that it was not an accident. Now, I will acknowledge that um, certainly the um, uh, summary that was provided to the state um, uh, suggested that Dr. Diamond would be in a position to give uh, an opinion that uh, this was not intentional. Um, and that is, in fact, his opinion. But um, 
we will make it clear to, to Dr. Diamond and any witness that, that that is not appropriate for them to use that specific language, that um, uh, anything that happened was, was or was not intentional. So um, to that extent, Judge, I, uh, frankly, I think that we, um, we, we agree on what the law is. Um, but I believe that the witness um, absolutely uh, can testify to um, um, his opinion that based on his experience that, that what happened here was the result of a failure of memory systems. That's not the ultimate issue. I mean, the jury can decide if they want whether, uh, whether it was an accident, whether it was intentional, whether it was malice, whether it was criminal negligence. That's the ultimate issue. Um, so to that extent, Judge, I think that um, um, I don't think there's going to be any objections during the trial because we're not going to attempt to offer ultimate opinion um, testimony as prohibited by law. I guess that was a tip my way of uh, saying that they agree with us. So we'll accept it and we ask that you order that they not allow the defendant to our defense experts who then give an expert opinion on the uh, criminal intent of the defendant. Well, Rule 704 B applies to expert opinion about the United State, and it's not restricted to testimony concerning insanity. And that's U.S. versus Awful, OFFI L666 F3168. So I read the motion. Mr. Evans is back. Do you want to uh, proceed or put back to what was we were doing? Well, I think we can go ahead and move forward with what we were doing. Okay. Um, Judge, I think I have uh, two more motions to handle that are about as lengthy as the prior one. So, let's go ahead and get those now. Thank you, Your Honor. That makes sense to me. And the next motion I have, Judge, is a motion limiting to exclude the testimony of Dr. Uh, Agarkar in this case. Um, your Honor, I think looking at the motion and, uh, again and looking at his, uh, what he's provided, what the defense has provided in their opinion summary of the expert, and then also looking back at what he told me, um, I think that whereas it looked like I was, I had attempted, I was going to really try to exclude everything that he had put in here to or told me about uh, him testifying to, I think that if he does offer up opinion based on not necessarily what he told me, but what the, the defense uh, put in their expert opinion that he would testify about uh, how people react differently to stress and trauma and things of that nature. Uh, I think that that, that would be uh, admissible if they do go that route. So uh, I'm going to limit my, my motion to exclude testimony of Dr. Agricar, um in the ways, uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute, how I'm going to ask you and what I'm going to ask that you exclude. Um, first of all, uh, procedurally, as I told you, we, we talked to him the day his name was provided, April 6, 2016. Uh, Dr. Agarkar, actually, I spoke with him on that day. He talked to me for a while, provided me um, a one-page summary of, of his work and his statement with the defendant uh, that's just handwritten uh, back from February 9, 2016. When I talked with Ms. Dr. Agarkar, um, he, he had told me he'd reviewed these different reports and things like that. What, what troubled me was is that he was going to be offering as an expert to basically talk about the credibility of witnesses and get his opinion about people's perceptions at the scene, um, specifically uh, the defendant. Uh, and he would give a – he would try to give an opinion that based on what he has viewed um, that the defendant's statement uh, could have been genuine – uh, and that uh, that he thought you know his his actions were genuine at the scene and at the station. Now I asked him further about that. He said, "Well, yeah, it's possible he was he was not genuine. He was acting, or these these behaviors were out of the ordinary." But he wanted to give the opinion that he thought the defendant was being credible, basically. So what we're asking is that the defendant or the defense expert be banned uh, or excluded from doing that, but also. Uh, he, through the statements he gave to me and that were provided in this uh, recitation of his interview with the defendant, he wanted to give statements that, the, based upon the, the defendant's statements to him, uh, basically 
trying to elicit lay testimony or testimony that you do not need an expert through, um, through the prism of an expert. Uh, for instance, Judge, in, in speaking with him, uh, in addition to him saying he wanted to give that expert opinion on the credibility of the defendant as far as his behavior at the scene, um, he also talked about in uh, my discussions with him and with uh, his statement to the defendant that uh, he wanted to talk about, he said he expected to testify about that the, uh, the fact that the defendant does not like to show emotion in front of a bunch of people. And he wanted to do that uh, and testify as an expert about that to try to buttress the defense's argument. Uh, just some other things. He was going to try to explain why the defendant used cop talk, um, how he knows criminal statutes, uh, how he's comfortable about police, explaining other issues in the case, basically based upon what the defendant t told him. And at this point, you've ruled uh, are at this point inadmissible. Um, what he is trying to do, this D Dr. Agarkar, I don't know if the defense has talked to him about this and they know that he had told me he was going to try to testify to these things. He's basically trying to use expert testimony to uh, explain the defendant's statements and basically try to get his defense out without the defendant taking the stand in the case. And that is completely and wholly improper. Um, there are several reasons that uh, Dr. Agarkar's opinion testimony about what he's reviewed about the crime scene, what he's reviewed of witnesses' statements, I guess to, to try to talk about the credibility of their statements and things like that, several reasons why those should be excluded. Um, first, this testimony is inadmissible because you cannot testify about the credibility of another witness, and you especially cannot come in and have an expert testify about the credibility of other witnesses. Um, United States versus Warner, which is 2013, United States District Lexus 186862, it's Northern G District of Georgia, April 7, 2014. Uh, in that case, the defendant attempted to have an expert opine that the defendant was telling the truth based upon polygraph examination. Uh, during uh, or in that opinion, uh, the, the court held that the jury is the lie detector based on the evidence that comes out and determinations of credibility fall within the exclusive province of the jury. Another person's opinion as to credibility based on a brief encounter at another time and place, in this case, almost two years later, for an hour and 45 minutes, talking to the defendant and reviewing bits and pieces of perceptions of the crime scene, um, what that does it, it supplies the jury only with another opinion in addition to its own about whether the witness was telling the truth. Um, further, uh, Warner uh, cites Humbert versus the city of College Park, which is 2007 United States District Lexus 98174. That's Northern District of Georgia. In that case, uh, it cites United States versus Ballou. That's B-I-L-L-U-E. That's a 1993 11th Circuit case. I do not have the site on that. But in citing that case in the uh, Humber case, which I, uh, is, is in Warner and is provided, the credibility of the defendant is a matter within the exclusive province of the jury and also not helpful to the jury because whether someone or not is telling the truth is, beyond, is not beyond the average uh, understanding of a layperson. Um, Also, Judge, this is inadmissible, him talking about uh, the defendant and try to get expert opinion specifically about the defendant's behaviors at the scene and whether they were credible or not. Um, I'd cite to U.S. versus Monroe, which is 2015, United States District Court, Lexus 153479, 2015 case. Uh, they held there that testimony of an expert was tantamount to expert opinion about whether the defendant had a mental state necessary for the crime's charge. Um, in that case, the defendant did not. Uh, dispute that he had provided pr protection during a time when there was some type of drug dealing. He just claimed that he didn't knowingly do it. That's very similar in this case. Uh, the expert's going to try to basically provide expert testimony to explain his behavior at the scene um, and I believe stating like he did to me that he was going to give these opinions that he was genuine, uh, that would invade the province of the jury. And Judge, further, uh, there would be further argument uh, if the defendant's, uh, defense attorneys do try to get into statements the defendant made to the expert um, about why another reason this would be admissible, inadmissible would be the gist of everything he told me he was going to testify about 
was an attempt to be an underround, end around to get the defendant's statement in and would merely be a conduit for inadmissible hearsay. Um, in trying to get the defendant's statement out, basically um, most of what Dr. Agarkar told me that he wanted to testify about were things and based on things the defendant told him two years later. Uh, all of those things, which I summarized earlier, are things for which, if they're based in the evidence and they come out, do not need expert testimony to explain. Oh, he used certain language because he used to be in law enforcement. You don't need an expert to testify about that. The defense can make an argue about that. That is not something uh, that is outside the average uh, experience of a layperson. So, Judge, I do ask that you exclude any testimony by Dr. Agarkar regarding whether he believes the defendant's reactions as opposed to other people, uh, whether his opinion is that they were genuine. Um, also, uh, I would ask that you exclude any uh, attempts for him to try to go into uh, statements made by the defendant and then explain uh, in some expert mode something that would be ordinarily understood by a layperson. Um, we do not uh, challenge, or at this point we do not challenge, Dr. Agarkar if he's going to come in and he's qualified in the field of how people react to stress and trauma. <clears throat> we know from the first time that this case uh, had, had, any, had any hearing, First, first time anything was done in court at the probable cause hearing back in July of 2014. We knew from that moment that the state, uh, part of their case was to proffer um, evidence and insinuation and argument that um, Mr. Harris's actions or inactions or his behavior or his responses suggest a lack of remorse or suggest some um, knowledge or nefarious intent. This is a big part of the state's case. We've received a lot of discovery um, and, and we, we've uh, gone through a lot of materials in two years. It's very clear this is a part of the state's case that they're going to try to drive a truck through. We have the right to confront that. We have the right to put up evidence uh, to contest that. And so we have um, enlisted Dr. Agarkar. He has reviewed certain materials in the case. He has spoken with Mr. Harris. He's provided to uh, the state his, his written notes. <clears throat> and what the state wants to do is they want to file a motion to cut out any, uh, any mechanism for us to confront uh, their case, for us to confront any evidence that they're saying suggests that um, his behavior responses were not remorseful or otherwise nefarious. In doing so, I think they've, uh, this motion is a bit misleading. Looking at it, paragraph five, says the nature of this testimony is proffered by the defendant in the two sentence summary. This is their motion. Seeks to admit expert testimony on the credibility of witnesses and defendant. Well, take a look at the summary we provided them. And all we've indicated was he was going to offer an expert <clears throat> testimony opinion in the area of stress and trauma relating to the defendant's actions and reactions in connection with the death of his child and his arrest. So I think the state is wrong, very wrong, when they suggest that we're, um, his, his testimony that we would proffer would have anything to do about the credibility of witnesses and the defendant. They cite to the court uh, one case in support of this, which is United States versus Warner. This is, uh, I believe, another uh, unpublished um, district court case, which essentially says, well, we, where you've got a lie detector evidence, somebody can't come in and say, yeah, they were telling the truth. Yeah, they were lying. I, I 
think that's pretty obvious. That doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about here. Paragraph 6 of their motion says <clears throat> that in the two-sentence summary I just, I just read to the court that the defense is seeking to serve as a mere conduit for otherwise inadmissible hearsay. Well, that, that's not at all what the summary says. That's not at all what we intend to do. That's not at all the purpose of, of calling uh, Dr. Agarkar as an expert. But this is the way the state wants to uh, uh, sort of couch it um, to, to preclude him from being able to come in and testify. Paragraph 7 says, again, they're looking, looking at the summary that we provided, and they say, say that our summary seeks to admit extrinsic evidence of specific instances of the defendant's conduct regarding truthfulness. Well, that's not true. That, that's not true at all. That's not, that's not what is in the proffer, and it is not, in fact, what it is that uh, the purpose of Dr. Garkar's testimony. <clears throat> so, take a look at take a look at a couple of cases that I want the court to, to be aware of. Um, the rule that we're dealing with is 24-7-703, and so I went back to the prosecutor's handbook, um, Carlson on evidence, and looked at some of the cases that they cited in there. And one of them is Velasquez. And the summary of Velasquez, and I'm on page 457, fourth edition. Um, no, there's no problem with expert opinion based on an expert's interview of the accused plus her review of his medical records and conversations with other experts. Well, when we go and read the opinion, what, what it's clear, uh, clearly saying is that um, experts are permitted to testify to statements of the accused which form the basis of the expert's opinion. It, it is, I mean, it's just, it's just this simple. You know, anytime you've got an expert who, who's going to give an opinion, who's taken information from all kind of different sources, and it's certainly not uncommon for one of those sources to be some statement or statements from the accused. That's part of the basis of their opinion. And that's what this, the, there's nothing, there's nothing remarkable about that at all. And, and that's what the state here suggests, well, we, we, we can't hear any of that because it all goes just, uh, it, it all deals with credibility. So we can't, um, we can't hear any of that. That's not the case. I want the court to um, take note of another opinion, Reinhardt, R-E-I-N-H-A-R-D versus the state. This is a 2015 case of the Court of Appeals 331, Georgia Appeals 235. Um, in this case, we're looking at um, uh, the defense is suggesting that the trial court should have excluded the testimony of a therapist and psychologist because it did what? Well, it bolstered the testimony of the of the child. The court disagreed. And what they said is this. <clears throat> the fact that such testimony may indirectly, though necessarily, involve the child's credibility does not render it inadmissible. Looking at Odom versus the state in that opinion, there is absolutely nothing wrong with expert opinion testimony that bolsters the credibility of the indicted allegations of sexual abuse. The victim's psychological evaluations was consistent with sexual abuse. The therapist came in and the psychologist came in and gave specific testimony that the, um, um, the symptoms and the behavior were consistent with a child experiencing serious trauma from sexual abuse. Psychologists testified that each girl's demeanor and behavior during her forensic interview was consistent with that of a child who had been molested. So, I mean, what we're talking about here is really something that happens every time that we have a, a, a child case. Certainly, um, is that you've got experts that might 
might look at a, a, a statement of the child at the time, as well as a forensic interview, and then offer an opinion on it, whether or not that, that, that behavior is consistent with what it is the expert is opining. And that's all we're talking about here. Uh, we're not talking about um, discussing the credibility of, of any witnesses. We're not talking about um, uh, being a conduit for a statement of the defendant so he doesn't have to testify. That, that's, not at, that's not at all what, what we have proffered. Uh, I wasn't privy to the conversation that Mr. Warren had with Dr. Agarkar, but I, I, I can tell you from our perspective, that's certainly not why we would be offering this opinion. We would be offering it for exactly uh, the reason and purpose stated in our proffer. He will provide expert testimony and opinion in the area of stress and trauma relating to defendant's actions and reactions in connection with the death of his child and his arrest. So I, I think the state's motion is misleading and is trying to reframe and recouch what it is that Dr. Agarkar is, is going to be testifying about. So in that regard, Judge, I would ask that you, um, you deny this motion. And Judge, I did base it mostly on asking Dr. Agarkar to explain what was meant by that uh, summary. What do you mean by explaining trauma and things like that? And I agree, if, if the defense, if they, and that's something we can approach down the road, uh, much like in a sexual abuse case, if they ask questions about is this behavior consistent with something like this, somebody that suffered trauma, I don't see any problem with that. What I'm objecting to is Dr. Agarkar explaining the summary by saying, I'm going to opine that I thought he was genuine in his reaction. Uh, obviously, in a child sexual abuse case, the defense would throw a fit if we had witnesses up there saying, yeah, I thought the child was genuine and truthful. Of course, that would be improper. That's exactly what Dr. Agarkar told me that he was gonna testify about. Um, further, what he keyed in on when he told me, when I'm seeking to exclude, if there are other things that they wanna get into uh, down the road that don't fit what he told me, that I, maybe that'll be admissible. But based on what he told me, um, he also said he was gonna try to get into uh, things of explaining the defendant's conduct for which there would be no reason to call an expert. Um, the defense, we're not trying to prohibit them from explaining certain things if they want to. There's evidence admissible both from the defendant's statement, from their witness and things like that to explain why he might be quirky or why he might talk a lot or why he might do this or that. You don't need an expert to come in and transmit that. That is something that they can get out through other evidence that you do not need an expert uh, to use as a conduit for uh, hearsay and inadmissible evidence. When the defense talked about 24-7-703, um, Judge, what you cannot do uh, under that is facts and data that are otherwise inadmissible shall not be disclosed to the jury by the proponent of the opinion um, or inference unless the court determines their probative value in assisting the jury to evaluate the expert's opinion substantially outweighs the prejudicial effect. And the, the starting point is, it's inadmissible unless the defense can come in here and show, well, this is going to exceed uh, the prejudicial value substantially, the probative value is. Uh, Judge, we don't have that here. We're not even at that point. All we have is this is inadmissible evidence under the rule. While an expert can rely on stuff that may not be admissible at trial when they form their opinion, studies, things like that, what they can't do is put it before the jury. That's exactly what Rule 703 says, and that's exactly what Mike's Train House versus Lionel says. Uh, 472 F. 3rd 398, which is a Sixth Circuit case, 2006. The expert in that case relied on statements and hearsay and opinions of others, uh, other experts as well, and attempted to disclose all of this evidence to the jury. Uh, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in that case affirmed the language in 703. Uh, here it's worse. Um, they're actually attempting to admit substantive evidence that is otherwise inadmissible. Uh, that's two years later, after the defendant's hearing statements, things like that. He's trying to go through an expert, according to Dr. Agarkar, when he's telling me what he's going to testify to, to get out his story and explain it through an expert. So, Judge, 
We are not trying to keep the defense from presenting their defense. We're trying to keep them uh, from doing it in an improper and inadmissible manner. So in sum, I ask you to exclude the defense expert from being able to give an opinion as to whether the defendant was genuine or truthful or not. And then also prohibit them, uh, the expert, from going into uh, statements of fact that would be uh, giving an opinion on things that a layperson could about why he might talk a certain way if he was a police officer. These are things that can be explained through argument and through other witnesses, not given them the imprimatur of an expert. attempting to do. Uh, I guess logistically it's a little bit more difficult now that we're not going to be uh, right next door to the police department, but we are trying to make accommodations to, in fact, uh, have the motor vehicle in question, the defendant's car, towed to Brunswick. Um, if we do that, uh, we would like the opportunity to actually have a, an evidentiary view. Uh, we believe that uh, with this, the way that the courts look at jury views it can either be an evidentiary view where you're looking at evidence which is just too big, bulky, or affixed to actually fit in the courtroom. Uh, and you also have scene views, where, and the standards are different about what can and cannot be done. Uh, we can see that this is an evidentiary view. We would be looking at evidence, having the jury view evidence uh, in the case. Uh, the case that really describes the difference in these two views is Jordan versus the state, which is 247 Georgia, 328. Um, it describes the difference between an evidentiary view and a scene view. So, Judge, we would be asking to actually conduct a, a jury view of the motor vehicle. Um, looking, just kind of going forward, maybe to think in the future, if, if Your Honor grants the ability to do this, uh, we'll sit down with the defense and maybe discuss it with Your Honor in court later uh, what the rule and rules and procedures we're going to do or follow to do it, depending on the circumstances uh, in Brunswick and where we can go, where we can set things up. Um, I know it's just looking at Esposito versus the state, which is 273 Georgia, 183. Uh, that's a 2000 case. They do talk about certain things that should happen. Uh, the trial judge should attend the view. A uh, court reporter should attend. Uh, the defendant and the defense attorney should attend. And specifically, the witnesses involved should not attend. So just as I'm asking permission for Your Honor uh, to allow a jury view in this case. And then uh, as we get down there looking at what we're dealing with as far as space and logistics, um, how we might set it up. I just provided those cases to, to see some of the limitations that we may have to do once we uh, get down there. Case cited by Mr. Boring, Esposito versus the state, 273 Georgia, 183. That's a 2000 case. Georgia Supreme Court. This is the warning that our Supreme Court gave. Because jury views have proved to be a fertile ground for irregularity and at times reversible errors, the parties to criminal trials and trial courts should carefully weigh the real benefits of a jury view before planning one. Frequently, as in Esposito's case, the jury has already viewed photographs of the crime scene. And nothing is to be added to the jury's understanding of the issues to be tried by an in-person visit to the scene. Now, the vehicle here is the same. <clears throat> in such cases, a trial court would be authorized to deny a request for a jury view. In this particular case, the jury is going to have the photographs of the vehicle, uh, not only at not only at the Acres Mill location, 
but likely in other locations as well, including including the um, including the evidence shed. That's the highest and best evidence of that vehicle. Not only that, we expect there's going to be video video of walk around, excuse me, walk around with uh, inside and outside of the um, of the vehicle. So I guess the question is, what's the um, I mean, what's the purpose? And the jury's already going to have not only photographs, likely video, they're also going to have extremely, extremely detailed measurements <coughs> of inside and outside the video. So um, is the state going to put the car seat back in the vehicle? So we know it's been taken out and put back in taken out put back in are they going to put the car seat back in are jurors going to be invited to get in the back seat or perhaps sit in the driver's seat they're going to be allowed to lean in and try to toss um, light bulbs across the front seat what we're talking about is creating evidence creating evidence when they've already got the evidence they need in photographs, and video, and measurement. So why does the state want to do this? Well, they want to put, they want to put jurors inside a crime scene and invite them to substitute their view for what Mr. Harris's view may have been, might have been, or was. For instance, um, as, as jurors approach uh, the vehicle, um, if they approach from the driver's side or from the front, they're going to be looking into the windshield to see if they can see a car seat, to see what they can see. Well, I submit to the court, if you're looking for something, you're going to see it. And that's what the state wants to do here. And the question isn't whether a juror putting them in that place, whether they can see it. The question is whether Mr. Harris could and, and, or did. And the jury's going to have all the evidence they need in multiple photographs, video, and measurements. Well, they can be invited to sit in the driver's seat themselves and look over their shoulder and Look in the rearview mirror to see whether or not, whether or not, um, perhaps <coughs> they personally w would have seen something, w w would have seen a car seat. That's not the issue. Okay, the issue is whether Mr. Harris could or did. And so you're, you're really, it's 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 like a golden rule uh, uh, issue, really, Judge. You, by doing this, what, what we're talking about is inviting the jury to decide something based on their own bias, their own opinion from the evidence they're creating by being there in the scene rather than Mr. Harris, rather than the evidence that day, the photographs, the measurements. <clears throat> I think um, I think it's plain and simple. It's asking, it's asking each and every juror to substitute their vision for Mr. Harris's. I also think this is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly dangerous uh, for, for us to go down there to try this case and try to do something like this. It is fraught with problems uh, as it can be. What if it's a hot day? What if it's a particularly hot day? Are we gonna invite jurors to get in that vehicle and sit, see how hot it is? maybe substitute their opinion for what they feel for what the victim felt. That's, that's really what we're talking about here, what the state wants to do. Just like a golden rule violation. And so the last question I would ask is, if, if they don't intend to do all this, 
if they don't intend to um, have them walk up to the car, if they don't intend to open it up, have them sit in the driver's seat, have them sit in the back seat, then why are we doing it? Because we got a big old stack of photographs of that car from every angle you can imagine, inside and out, that are coming in. We've got crime scene detectives that took a mountain of measurements. All that's coming in. Nothing, absolutely nothing, is gained. Uh, the jury learns nothing more, nothing more by going to sit in that car or going up to that car. It only invites the jury to substitute their view for Mr. Harris's. I strongly encourage the court uh, not to go down this road. <clears throat> Judge, this, as I said, is not a scene view. This is not a scene. What we're asking you to allow us to do, as we should be allowed to under the law, is allow the jury to look at the murder weapon. That's exactly what this is. The state alleges that car was the murder weapon. While there may be pictures and things like that, I appreciate the defense wanting to try my case for me and tell me what I can and can't do and what I need and don't need. However, I have a sneaking suspicion, well, maybe they will cross-examine the crime scene text about their photographs. And maybe they had bias about how they took them. And maybe they had bias about the angles that they took these photographs. And we didn't get all the angles. But that's why we're seeking to introduce the actual murder weapon in this case. Judge, uh, the case law is, is, is clear that we are allowed to do this. He wants to throw out this parade of horribles of all these things we're going to seek to do. All I asked was to bring the car down and let the jury look at it. And then your honor can get limiting instructions, can uh, tailor this view as we can all see fit to keep those dangers from taking place in this case, but to allow the jury to see the actual item of evidence that was used in this case. I think the theory is trying to bring the vehicle and have a view. Um, I think the details of how it will be conducted. Um, right now, it's subject to speculation. That's what we're doing. I'm trying to develop uh, approach to making decisions. We'll have to have a hearing and flush out what will and will not be done, uh, where the vehicle will be, uh, what day, what time of day, and under what circumstances and what the jury will be observing. You know, we need to be prepared to make a very explicit offer of what we expect to have uh, and do and when and where. And you can let them know in advance so they can think about it and be ready to uh, express their uh, concerns, thoughts, objections, opinions. Yes, sir. What do we have next? Now, Your Honor, I think we're at the point where we can pick back up with Mr. Evans' uh, motion to be Let's go. Take a spot or return to the stand. Judge, these would be uh, motions 21 and 22 that we're back on. Can go back to number one? Those are the defense motions. Well, I'll find my second one. You're welcome. All right, Detective, when I left off with you, we had just authenticated some photographs that you were entering and admitted. Do uh, you recall that? I do. And you, I'll remind you, by the way, that you're under a oath still from the OA this morning before we took our break. That's uh, right. Yes, sir. These, these photographs that uh, I now have in my hands, states one through five, uh, to refresh the court's recollection, these are photographs of the defendant by his vehicle at the Home Depot parking lot uh, shortly after the lunch break from that particular date. Is that correct? That is correct. And uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is just to hold these up one at a time for the court so that Judge Staley can see those and just describe using your fingers to point out where that vehicle is and where a defendant can be seen. States 1. And States 1, if you look here in the corner, that's going to be the defendant's vehicle, defendant in the door frame with the door open. 
and you just set that down at your side and to the left. Let's go through two. Uh, each one of these are obviously a, a still shot in time from this event that you observed from the Home Depot video, video correct? That is correct. And the record should reflect this event that Yes. Go ahead. And the second photograph, Judge, it's the same. The vehicle is in the left-hand corner. That's the uh, defendant's vehicle and defendant in the door frame. Similar fashion states exhibit number three. If you could hold that up and describe the court what that depicts. Number three, it shows the vehicle again in the same position with the defendant outside of the vehicle. And then the last two uh, items of evidence, uh, four and five, just hold those up and it shows essentially the vehicle in the same spot within the parking lot and defendant within that door frame, correct? That is correct. And you can just put four and five up to the left. Um, We'll, we'll start with this particular area. Um, you're familiar with who David Dustin is, correct? I do. I am. I'm sorry. And uh, D David Dustin uh, does some 3D crime scene scanning and mapping. Is that accurate? That is very accurate. Uh, in, in this particular case, we enlisted the services of Mr. Dustin to scan several areas, the first of which was that Home Depot parking lot, correct? Um, several areas were, yes. Let's talk about the Home Depot parking lot first because we'll kind of do it chronologically from that day. Um, did you actually uh, participate in any way in the scanning process or make that parking lot available to him so that he could use his Faro uh, 3D scanner? We just made the parking lot available. We worked with Home Depot security. Um, we put up cones to make sure the parking spot was empty that the defendant had used that day. Um, and I did accompany him to um, 2600 Cumberland to watch him perform the scans. Uh, in similar fashion, at some point in time, was he also provided access to the defendant's vehicle so that he could perform scans both inside and outside of that vehicle? Yes, sir. And um, you were a participant in making that vehicle available to him so that he could conduct his 3D mapping and 3D scanning, correct? That is correct. Now, once uh, these scans were taken, I want to focus on the Home Depot parking lot and the vehicle. Uh, did you discuss with him and provide information to him about the location of the vehicle and defendant as he stood in the door frame such that he could uh, um, uh, adjust his 3D scan to account for that? I did. And um, specifically the photographs that we provided uh, to, to the court, do they demonstrate where specifically you told him the vehicle would have been located from the Home Depot video as defendant stood in that door, door jam? They do. And have you had an opportunity to review uh, Mr. Dustin's scan of the actual Home Depot parking lot that includes the vehicle and um, where, where the defendant was standing? I have. Does it accurately demonstrate spatial proximity and location of where defendant was as he accessed the vehicle on that day? It does. Does it accurately demonstrate where the vehicle was parked within the parking lot from, from that day? It does. <coughs> The, the second scene I now want to talk to you about, you talked about the final resting place by Little Matios, correct? Yeah, Uncle Matios. And um, we have uh, several photographs and some videos of defendant's vehicle there uh, when we wrote that off as a crime scene, is that correct? That's correct. And um, did you at some point ask David Dustin to also scan that area um, for, for purposes of presenting that in this case? I did. And. Um, did, did you accompany him, you and Cobb County Police Department, to, to sort of cordon off the area so that he would have the ability to do that and get an unobstructed 3D laser scan or image scan of that particular area? That is correct. In similar fashion with the Home Depot parking lot, did you also uh, give information to him about where defendant's vehicle would have been parked uh, during the day of the crime uh, in that particular location? I did. And have you seen the scan of that area that was uh, created by David Dustin using his 3D imaging software? I have. Does it accurately demonstrate where defendant's vehicle was parked when you responded to that crime scene? Yes, it does. Does it accurately demonstrate spatial proximity of the vehicle to the buildings that are uh, also scanned and located within that 3D scan? Yes, it does. We had touched on this just a, a little bit, but um, the, the, the scanning process also allows you to get some, some smaller scans too, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, did you um, allow Mr. Dustin to access the interior of the vehicle uh, so that a scan could be conducted with the car seat and the mannequin placed in the vehicle? We did. 
and um, having responded to the crime scene and seen the vehicle, uh, was the, the car seat accurately placed in the vehicle where um, you saw it uh, on the day of the crime? Yes. And um, have you seen that scan as well? I have. Does that scan accurately reflect spatial proximity of items within the vehicle? It does. And does it accurately demonstrate um, the, the, the interior of the vehicle and, and, and how it looked with the addition of the mannequin that was added um, to demonstrate where Cooper Harris would have been? That's correct. Were these 3D scans made in substantially similar conditions to the event in question? Yes. Were they made so near the same in a substantial particulars as to afford a fair comparison of what you saw, for instance, on the Home Depot video with the 3D scan? I believe so. And, and similarly, were they made so nearly in same in substantial particulars as to afford a fair comparison of the 3D scan to what you saw at the final resting place of defendant's vehicle? I believe so. As well as the interior of the vehicle, correct? That is correct. The uh, actual scan itself were placed on a hard drive. Excuse me, six. State 6 is going to be a small manila envelope containing two things. Uh, one is a hard drive and then one is a flash or thumb drive. Uh, you recognize this hard drive as being the hard drive that Mr. Dustin put the 3D scans on. I do. Uh, this 3D, excuse me, this thumb drive creates an actual scan of the interior of this courtroom, correct? That's correct. And um, included on the hard drive is the 3D imaging scan of this courtroom as well to demonstrate the accuracy of the 3D scanner? I believe so. And you were asked to initial these after viewing it to confirm that it accurately demonstrates these things that you've just discussed, correct? Correct. These are your initials right here. On that is my initial. And then CFG, that's Carrie Grimstead, your crime scene a technician that worked in this case too? That is correct. And you had him, uh, looks like, the day before, day, day before uh, he signed that. scans in particular, I need to ask you this question, well, well to, to the scans. Uh, did you obtain information the defendant provided to the Cobb County Sheriff's Office when he was booked into the jail in terms of his height? I did. Okay. And um, do you recall what his height was, self-disclosed height, his admission during um, to the jail staff? Yes, it was 6'2". And um, at some point, did you have a discussion with David Dustin about the defendant's height to account for certain things that were included in the scanning process? I did. And um, uh, specifically, did you share with David Dustin that uh, um, um, he was six foot two by his own admission to sheriff's office staff? That's correct. Yes. That's all I have for you. 
Call David Dustin. agent on the case. We think it would assist us with the orderly presentation of our case. Um, so we would ask that for motion hearing as well as the, the trial itself. Mr. Um, Ms. Davis, all the trial and murder cases we're talking about in the witness. I don't think he's going to use the case as father. I do. All right, sir, if you'll introduce yourself to the judge, spell your first and last name for our court reporter, the gentleman seated before you with the glasses. My name is David James Dustin. First name is A V I D. Last name is Dustin D U S T I N. Where are you employed, sir? I'm self employed. And what do you do? Uh, my company is Dustin Forensics. And what does Dustin Forensics specialize in? Uh, we specialize in 3D laser scanning, um, also 3D animation, uh, training of uh, various agencies and entities that desire to use 3D laser scanning. Tell the court, please, what is 3D laser scanning? Yes, sir. Uh, 3D laser scanning is effectively using a laser to capture uh, an environment or a scene um, effectively, at least the, the application that we use of it, um, it has a, um, it's a 1,550 nanometer laser beam that effectively is projected onto a scene or to an environment. Think of it as uh, painting the area with light, if you will. Sorry, and I'm sorry, think of it as? As painting the room or the environment with light. So, it, so it's projected from a central point um, on the from the device. Once the laser data is captured, then there is a second operation with a, a color camera that that captures the the coloring, if you will, of the environment as well. So it's based both on a laser as well as photographic evidence. Yes, sir. That's correct. And um, what specifically is the name of the product that you use to accomplish this 3D laser scanning? And we use a Ferro X330 laser. Can you spell Ferro for our court reporter? F A R O. What sort of training, education, and experience do you have that qualifies you to use this uh, Ferro 3D laser scanning imaging capture device? I was originally trained by the manufacturer um, effectively before it was used uh, in any kind of forensic capacity. Um, from then on, then we applied the, the scanning technology uh, and assisted the manufacturer in developing it for use uh, with law enforcement and uh, also engineering, uh, helped them to develop the case and the, the, cor uh, excuse me, the course curriculum. Uh, testing manner, things like that. And um, have you ever been tendered as an expert in 3D scene mapping and 3D laser scanning before? I have here in Georgia and then also uh, in June in the state of Tennessee. And in fact, you were tendered um, by me as an expert in a murder trial that uh, was conducted before Honorable Judge Adele Grubbs recently. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. Judge, at this time, I'll tender David Dustin as an expert in 3D laser scanning and crime scene mapping. I'll, I'll question him. I'll question that. Um, 
All right. In this particular case, uh, you are called upon by our office in the in, in Cobb County Police Department to assist in some crime scene mapping. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. Uh, I want to talk to you about three specific locations that appear to be the subject subject of these motions. The first one is the Home Depot parking lot. Are you familiar with that area? Yes, sir. I am. And um, can you tell the court where you provided an opportunity by Detective Stoddard in Cobb County Police Department to conduct a 3D laser scan and image capture of the parking lot in question. Yes, sir, I was. And describe to the court what the process was and how it is that you were able to accomplish that task. Yes, sir. So uh, effectively, you, you place the scanner, the 3D laser scanner, in positions um, around the scene. And then the, the software, or excuse me, the scanner will capture the data from the scene um, the number of scans on a scene depend upon the level of capture desired as far as the amount of detail. Uh, then the software, uh, you take the data uh, and you insert it into a computer and it does what's called registration, which is effectively um, placing the scans in the proper orientation. If we want to describe the, the scanner itself, essentially what it looks like is a, is a tripod, is that, is that correct? Yes, sir. The, the scanner itself is, uh, think of a, an old-style lunchbox. It's approximately that size, and it has, uh, it mounts on top of uh, a tripod. And um, the, the scanner essentially s spins and takes uh, slices of laser scans and then makes Im image capture. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So, uh, so it ha there's, a, there's an onboard. The laser is emitted from, from an in, inside cavity that's reflected by a mirror. The mirror is rotating, and as the mirror rotates, then it, it projects that laser beam onto the surfaces. And then once the laser capture portion is completed, then, it, uh, then the camera will rotate and will take a series of 85 images, stitch those together to, to create a panoramic image, and then also that colored, that colored data is applied to the laser scan. Now, in this particular case, um, you were asked to scan several large areas, including the Home Depot parking lot. Yes, sir, that's correct. Did, did that take a period of time, and did you make multiple laser scans in order to have all of that data available to your computer system? Yes, sir. It took approximately two hours to scan the Home Depot parking lot. At some point in time during this case, did you also have an opportunity to scan defendant's vehicle? Yes, sir, I did. And um, are, are you able, using this software, to um, use that scanned vehicle and insert that into the parking lot in the exact area where the vehicle would have been parked, per the information given to you from Detective Stoddard? Yes, sir, that's correct. As well as the defendant and where his location would have been from captured Home Depot video? Yes, sir, that's correct. The judge has already seen State's Exhibits 1 through 5. One of them is actually right here beside you on the left. Um, I showed you these images. All of them are. You are correct. They're all here, Judge. Um, these images to show you the capture of the actual defendant's vehicle and defendant from Home Depot video. Yes, sir. You see that? Yes, sir. And um, having conducted your Home Depot laser scan and having talked to Detective Stoddard about the precise location of defendant and defendant's vehicle uh, during the day of the crime in question, did you uh, in, ensure that your scan of the parking lot included and demonstrate where defendant's vehicle was on that day? Yes, sir, well, that's correct. I'm going to object to that. Um, I don't believe this witness has testified that he saw those photographs um, at the time. Based on his report, I don't think he's ever seen those photographs before. I'll ask, yeah. what, I'll ask the question this way. Did you see those this morning? Yes, sir, I did. And have, you have the 3D laser scan you created, correct? Yes, sir, I did. Does your laser scan accurately demonstrate, as those photos depict, where defendant's vehicle is and where he was standing? Yes, sir, they do. And did you retain that information prior to looking at the photographs from this man here, Detective Phil Stoddard? Yes, sir, that's correct. Using the 3D uh, laser scan, are, are you able to maneuver the, the scans so that we can actually see things from different angles? We don't actually maneuver the scans, but we, we, we can maneuver the camera um, in, inside of the virtual environment. 
Did you also speak to Detective Phil Stoddard about um, the final resting place of defendant's vehicle, the crime scene that they responded to where Cooper Harris was located? Yes, sir. In addition, uh, when we had performed the laser scan at that location, the paint markings were still on the asphalt so that we could use that to also place the vehicle. I want to ask you a little bit about that. Have you ever uh, used this scanning process to assist step units or um, traffic enforcement units for um, vehicle-related crimes? Uh, I, well, when I yes, uh, with the step unit specifically, um, it was a, it was a case where an individual was lying in a roadway and they were impacted by a, a vehicle. That's the case where you testified as an expert um, in, a, in a trial that I handled, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. And as with um, this particular case, in that case, were there also markings on the roadway that you were able to utilize and incorporate into your scan data? Yes, sir, there was. So let's talk about um, Little Matteo's then, the uh, final resting place of the vehicle. Did you use this same 3D laser scanning and image capture process at that location? Yes, sir, I did. And using the markings that were there on the ground from this particular case, were you able to place the scanned vehicle um, that, that you had of defendants in the exact location where police officers uh, found it from the response to the crime? It was approximately in the same location, yes, sir. And does it accurately demonstrate spatial proximity and distances within that scene that you scanned? Yes, sir. About how long did it take you to scan that that area, do you recall? It's approximately an hour and a half to two hours. Uh, you'd already given some testimony about this, but I want to talk about the third uh, scanning question in this particular motion, the scan of the interior of defendant's vehicle. Yes, sir. Uh, was there a scan that was performed on, on the inside of the vehicle as well? Yes, sir, there was. Um, for, for our record, when you scanned that, there was also a car seat that had been placed in the vehicle with a mannequin of Cooper Harris? Yes, sir, that's correct. And describe for the court how it is that you uh, able, were able to accomplish that scan with inside, within the interior of the vehicle. So the tripod that the, that the device sits on or is mounted on top of has, it's adjustable. And so effectively what we did was we adjusted the height of the of the laser scanner placing it in the driver's seat and uh, the defendant and I are approximately the same height I asked detective Stoddard to uh, view me sitting in the seat and then once I had placed the 3d laser scanner in that same location I asked him to verify the accuracy of the placement okay so uh, did detective Stoddard tell you that the defendant um, is 6'2"? I said I remember him saying approximately six three, but that's what I remember. Okay, and about how tall are you, just for all record? About six three. Okay, and um, the 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 scanner, did you adjust it to essentially eye level inside the vehicle? Yes, sir. Eye level, eye level with me. And um, were you able to get a three D scan of the interior view of the vehicle with? the car seat and with the mannequin of Cooper Harris in that car seat? Yes, sir, that's correct. Does it uh, accurately demonstrate the interior of the vehicle as you observed it? Yes, sir. Does it accurately demonstrate spatial proximity of items within the vehicle, including distance, for example, uh, from the scanner to the, the car seat that was in the back seat? Yes, sir, it does. For all of these animations, are you, are you well, I shouldn't say animations, for all these uh, mapping, these scans, uh, are you able to go in using the software and actually make me measurements as well? Yes, sir, that's correct. And um, how is it that this, these items of evidence can actually be pr uh, presented in court? From a graphical standpoint, are you sure. asking? Yes, so, so you can, either using the software, you can create, you could do a screen capture of a, of a measurement uh, you can also uh, you can display the panoramic images in a variety of methods. One is you can export the panoramic image and view it on an iPad. The other is you can uh, also view that image within the software. For the, the last scan that I was talking to you about in, in terms of our discussion, to, to confirm the, the height of the scan, can you actually look in the rear view mirror to see if you can see out of the back of the vehicle using the, the, the laser scans you, you captured? Yes, sir, for, uh, from the images. Yes, sir, you can. Right. To demonstrate the accuracy of this software that you use, at some point I asked you to come and actually scan this courtroom so we could show Judge Staley how it works. Is that correct? Yes, sir, you did. And we did that in similar fashion to the other trial we had before Judge Grubbs? That's correct. And um, this is state exhibit number six. 
the external hard drive that you have here. It's got your signature and a date on it, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. And you recognize this as being the uh, hard drive that contains the laser scans that you've just given testimony about? Yes, sir. Uh, in addition to that, I ask you to bring in, as part of State 6, a scan of this courtroom from the judge's bench perspective. Yes, sir. At some point, did you have a, a 3D laser scanner that was essentially where Judge Staley is seated now? Fairly close. I believe it was on the, the top rail there, or possibly on the, the desk area. So when you're talking about the iPad technology that you have, uh, did, did you send that to me, and did we place it on the external hard drive so we could demonstrate for the court how, how the scanner would work from that vantage point? Yes, sir, that's correct. And that's the blue thumb drive included in state fix? Yes, sir. A tender state state. All right. Um, what you did here in the courtroom, is that the same scanning process that you just discussed for all of the crime scenes that we've talked about? Yes, sir. Okay. With that, I'm going to ask you to step down, and we're going to use this microphone here. Um, I had this queued up earlier today. Um, I'd, I'd like you to uh, show the court exactly how this works. We'll make sure we use the microphone so that our court reporter can hear us. If you'll bring up the uh, 3D scan of the interior of this courtroom so we can demonstrate to the court how the software works. So what we've done is we've captured, we've captured the environment inside of this courtroom with our with a 3D laser scanner. And it'll take just a moment for the, the data to populate. But then, so the, the scan data is, is incorporated together. It's, it's something called registration, which means that the scans are, the scans are oriented to each other. And then, because we have these, we have these laser scans, now we can actually move through this environment, this 3D environment, virtually. And this is the interior of Judge Staley's courtroom as you scanned it some months back uh, when we gave you access. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. And um, the scanning process that you've just talked about where you take multiple, multiple scans from multiple locations, that was accomplished in this case so that you could demonstrate the accuracy of it, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. And if you will, show the court how you're able to um, move through this 3D captured uh, image to show the various areas within the courtroom. So we can move, we can move to different positions. We can make, move above the, jury's, uh, the jury box. We can move around to the court reporter's viewpoint. We can move to um, either defense or prosecution desks. And does this technology allow you to demonstrate distances and spatial proximity of items within the area that you scan? It does. So we can pull, we can uh, acquire an image. So for instance, I can measure from the base of this podium to the corner, corner of the table, and it will give us that distance. Change our units. Of course, that would have been at the podium at the time that it was scanned, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. approximately six six and three quarters feet and you can do that in similar fashion with any area that you scan using your 3d ferro technology correct yes sir that's correct uh, did you use this same process on the three areas that are subject of the motion that being the home depot parking lot uh, little matios and the interior of the vehicle yes sir and as well as the exterior of the vehicle i want to um talk a little bit about the thumb drive. Do you have your iPad in here? I have it up there. If you will, the thumb drive that's the component of state's exhibit number six. You have that uh, scan actually incorporated onto an iPad, is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. Could you bring that up so we can show the court? 
Why don't you step up here with me and we'll just let the court take a look at it. So included on state's exhibit number six, can you see around my shoulder? Is this a scan site from behind the judge's bench, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. All right. And that's actually included on the thumb drive that's a part of state's exhibit number six, correct? Yes, sir. And from that, using the 3D technology, you're actually able to make a scan. Essentially, if the judge were standing up of what she might see in the courtroom. Yes, sir, that's correct. Did you use this same process for the interior of the defendant's vehicle, as you've described? Yes, sir, I did. I gave it to him this morning. I did show Mr. Rodriguez. Um, yeah, on my phone. Do you want to look at it again? Would that be enough? Mm -hmm. All right, we're good. The, the purpose of this 3D image capture is to demonstrate spatial proximity and distance. Is that, is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. Well, in, in particular for the item that they're complaining of, the, the scan of the interior of defendant's vehicle, you, you, you did not make that scan to demonstrate what defendant may or may not have actually seen. Is, is that accurate? I did not I did not make any assumptions as to what he could see or could not see. Rather, just the interior of the vehicle as it happened to appear from that particular height and that particular scan point. Yes, sir, that's correct. In similar fashion to what we just showed Judge Staley from uh, the um, scan of this courtroom from the location where she's generally sitting now. Yes, sir, that's correct. All right. Good morning, Mr. Dustin. Good morning, Mr. Gilgar. Uh, just a couple of things. Move this. Give me a little space. <clears throat> Just a couple things I want to make um, clear. <clears throat> Mr. Evans asked you twice uh, about appearing before Judge Grubbs. In, yes, sir. In this courthouse, right? Mm, I believe it was this courthouse. Yes, sir. Okay. And. Um, isn't it true that in that particular case, this evidence was not in any way challenged by the defense, was it? That's correct. You didn't appear at a motions hearing and have to go through any procedure like this because everybody just agreed, yeah, we, we want all that to come in. That was correct. Okay. And um, have, you, have you used this technology in a trial in Cobb County other than that case? No, sir, I have not. Okay. Um, but you have in, in Metro Atlanta? Uh, I was, the last, the other one was the one I mentioned in the uh, state of Tennessee. Okay. So that's the only time you've actually testified in, in trial using this technology? Yes, sir, that's correct. And it's it's um, fair to say it's, a, it's, it's a, a new business, it's new technology, you're trying to get it off the ground, right? Uh, it's actually been around for a while. Mm -hmm. um, it's mainly been adapted or adopted into uh, forensic use probably within the last five to six years. Okay. But you haven't even charged, you're not even charging the DA's office anything to do all this work, right? I am not. And the reason is because, again, it's, it's new and you're, you're trying to get exposure for this technology so that you can, uh, at some point in time, uh, be paid to do this very kind of work, right? Oh, it's kind of a loaded question. Uh, I would. Uh, my motivation for doing this is is to get exposure to the technology. Yes, that's true. Okay. <coughs> so we um, uh, we've seen this little uh, sort of demonstration this morning with the um, courtroom example, and. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about, about that. The, um, the scanning that you did of the courtroom was uh, an absolutely 100% static, fixed, exact space. And there, there, there were no other variables that you had to account for, were there? 
That's correct. Okay. In other words, um, you walk into an empty courtroom and you just scan it. You don't have to account for something that was there earlier and is not there now. Correct. But what you did in this case um, what wasn't exactly the same thing, was it? Well, when we scanned the Home Depot parking lot on July 4th, there were, I don't recall there being any vehicles in the parking lot besides ours. Um, there were really, were, if there were variables, it, was, it would be us. All right. Us in the same proximity. All right. Well, let's, let, let's, let's just go with that first then. Um, was there a, um, did you bring a vehicle and was a vehicle placed in the parking lot? There was a vehicle in the, the vehicle I drove, and I believe the vehicle uh, Detective Stoddard drove. Yes, sir. All right. And was that vehicle uh, purportedly the, the defendant's vehicle, Mr. Harris's vehicle? No, sir. No, okay. sir. What was it? There was my vehicle and, the, and Detective Stoddard's vehicle. All right. So it, it was not defendant's vehicle that was scanned in the parking lot at Home Depot? No, sir. It was not. And Mr. Evans asked you um, if, if the vehicle that you scanned in the parking lot was in the exact location. He did. In your testimony what, wasn't that it was in the exact location, but it was approximate. I said it was approximate, yes, sir. Okay. And the reason for that is that there's some guesswork involved. That's a, that's a variable because you are trying to recreate exactly where a vehicle may have been when you come into a scene where the vehicle's not there, it's been removed, right? I wouldn't call it guesswork, and it, and it, the reason I say approximate is because I wasn't there and I did not scan the scene that particular day, so I don't know exactly where it is. I can approximate it, but I don't know exactly where it is. Okay. You can approximate it. Yes, sir. And what's, your, what's the margin of error? How many inches or how many feet one way or another uh, to the left, to the right, front, back? I would say a safe estimate is probably within three or four inches of where it was. All right, so the variable is within three or four inches? That would be my estimate, yes, sir. Okay. And where are you getting that estimate from? And that's based on looking at the, the photographs and then also interacting with Detective Stoddard. All right. Well, let's start with photographs. Because according to your report, you got exactly one photograph of the vehicle, not Mr. Harris's vehicle, but a vehicle uh, in, in, in the parking lot, or did you get a video that was clipped out from the surveillance video? I did not see any video surveillance of the parking lot. Right. Let me just let me just show you this. I'm going to show him his report. Okay. Is this the video? Is this the photograph you got? Yes, sir. Okay. It was in color. All right. <clears throat> so if this purports to be a, a photograph um, cut from a um, surveillance video, that's all you got? That and working with Detective Stoddard. So I, I placed it initially and then I reviewed it with Detective Stoddard if that, was, if that would um, accurately depict his opinion of where the vehicle was located. All right. We'll get there. What I want to make clear is you got exactly one photograph that was cut from a surveillance video. You did not receive those photographs that you apparently were shown this morning. That's correct. All right. Is there anything else you were shown this morning uh, that you hadn't seen before? No, sir. Not that I recall. Okay. All right. So, can you tell us the date in which you received this photograph? Mm, no, sir, I don't recall. All right. Was it before or after July the 3rd of 2014? It would have been after. After July the 3rd? Yes, sir. that you did the 3D laser scanner at Home Depot on July the 1st, 2014. 
Does that mean that you did the scan before you ever received the photograph? Actually, we, I believe we scanned the Home Depot. It was the first or the second of July. And yes, the answer is correct. I did not have the photograph before I scanned it. All right. Do you want to see? Do you need to see your report? Uh, sure. How many times did you? Uh, how many times did you scan the scene at the Home Depot? I scanned it twice. Twice? Yes, sir. And one of those being July 1, the other one being July 4? It was July 1, July 1st or July 2nd. It was very close. The first time it was, it was very, um, the parking lot was full. And so we opted at that point to just terminate and come back when the parking lot would be empty. What did you do with those preliminary scans? I included them in the raw scan data. All right. When you went out there and did your scan on July the 4th, did anybody make you aware that there were uh, surveillance videos um, that captured um, Mr. Harris's vehicle that morning of the 18th? I don't believe we talked about any of that. I could see that there were surveillance cameras in the parking lot, but uh, I don't know that we discussed it prior to that. All right. Um, did you ever request to see the surveillance videos? Not that I recall. Okay. Just at some point in time, you became aware that perhaps they existed? That's fair. Yes, sir. Okay. And in doing in putting these together, I mean, it's fair to say from... Um, well, for accuracy, you you want as much actual information as you can you can have, right? I'm, that's sure. Okay, and, and you would agree with me that an actual surveillance video of the events in question is pretty much the highest and best source of the events in question, right? No, that's not necessary. I would say scene photographs are going to be much better. A scene diagram is going to be much better. Okay. Photographs or a diagram are going to be better than a video of the actual event occurring. I'm talking about, if we're talking about location of a vehicle, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. <clears throat> In addition to the single photograph you had, you indicated that you had to get other information from Detective Stoddard uh, as to the location of uh, where the vehicle was in the parking lot, right? I believe that's correct. Okay. When did he give you that information? Oh, I don't recall specifically. Um, but we scanned the area. We scanned the area, um, and he just he just instructed me where the where the correct location was, where the correct skull was. Okay. So did he tell you that on July the fourth, the day that you were out there doing the scan? Yes, sir. And actually, the the first day we were out there. Okay. The, if I remember correctly, that particular parking spot was uh, was blocked off. Uh, with cones, and I, I think it was taped off as well, right. if, I, if I remember correctly. All right, and then y'all moved the tape so uh, he could put another car in there that was not Mr. Harris's car. No, we didn't do any of that. All right, so you scanned, you scanned the vehicle in the parking lot, in the parking spot, other than the one depicted in the... Uh, Are you talking vehicle? about the first day, Mr. Kilgore? Talking about the day you did the scan. Which scan, sir? Uh, the, the scan that has been turned over to us of the... Uh, vehicle in the Home Depot parking lot. Uh, that would have been scanned the, the July 4th. There were no other vehicles other than my own and Detective Stoddard's in the area. Okay. And on that day, July 4th, Detective Stoddard told you where the uh, where the vehicle should be parked in the parking space, right? He just indicated which parking space the vehicle was in. All right. And did you put the car in the parking space, or did he? Are you talking about virtually or in reality? In reality. In reality, we never put the vehicle back in the space. Okay. You did You did the entire scan with no vehicle being there at all? That's correct. Okay. And what you're telling us is the margin of error is three or four inches to the left, to the right, to the front, to the back? Yes, sir. And that margin of error is based on the accuracy of what Detective Stoddard told you, right? I would say that's correct. Okay. So let's just say... He was off two feet. Yes, sir. Okay. That would affect the accuracy of 
of, of your scan. Of course. <clears throat> and again, <clears throat> we don't have any variable like that in the example that Mr. Evans showed the court of a static courtroom, correct? I'm sorry, say that again? We don't have any variable such as uh, guessing exactly where the car was or getting as close to as possible. We don't, we don't have that kind of variable in the example that Mr. Evans went over with you and the judge during your direct. Mm, that's correct. All right, so um, part of the scan or part of the uh, uh, creation that you did involved um, placing uh, an individual, a, a cartoon figure, if you will, at the vehicle, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. Right. And um, let's talk about where you got that information from. Yes, sir. Okay. You uh, were you shown any videos or photographs depicting on where uh, any individual was standing at that car? Just the one, and then the four that I saw this morning. But at the time I created that, I had the one photograph. Okay, just the one photograph that, that's that's in your report. Yes, sir. All right. So, how did we get? Uh, how did you get the information to know where to uh, where to place the uh, the cartoon figure in relationship to the vehicle, where his head was, where his eyes were fixed, where his arms were? Where did you get that information from, Detective Stoddard? Okay. And you would agree that the accuracy of um, um, the scan, or the, rather the, the creation that you made of cartoon, I mean, it's going to be based entirely on the accuracy of what Detective Stoddard told you. That's correct. So if he's off an inch or two, then your creation is going to be off an inch or two, right? That's correct. And if he's off three feet, your, your creation is going to be off three if feet. If he's off 100 feet, it's okay. off 100 feet. And if perhaps, and if perhaps the, the video, uh, the creation that you did shows two arms of the vehicle, when in fact there was only one arm in the vehicle, that that would be an inaccuracy in your creation, right? I suppose that would be true. Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Defense Exhibit 1. I've, I've showed this to the uh, state's lawyers. Do you recognize this, this image? Yes, sir, I do. What is that? That's a still frame of, um, it appears to be from a video. Still frame of a character placed with arms reaching into a vehicle. All right, and you would agree that that's a still from your um, from your creation. Yes, sir, that's correct. All right, I'm going to I'm going to move defense one. No objection. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, just uh, so the court will have something fixed to look at there. In defense one, we see a cartoon figure standing uh, in the door frame of a um, of, of a vehicle with two arms extended into the vehicle, right? Yes, sir, that's correct. Right. Where did you get that information that somebody had two arms inside a vehicle like that? From Detective Stoddard. Okay. Where did you get the information as to where the in the cartoon was looking? From Detective Stoddard. Okay. And what about the, uh, the depth of the cartoon figure um, in proximity to the vehicle, where did you get that information? From Detective Stoddard. Okay. So if he's right, you're gold. But if he's off, your, your creation is going to be off, right? That's correct. That particular figure uh, shows <clears throat> that um, there is no, um, apparently no windshield, no roof, no windows, no, no back windshield.
No, sir. Okay. So is that something then that you just decided to do on your own? What you're calling it looks like a convertible. There's actually something you do in the software where you can. It will effectively hide the data inside of it. So that's what we did. And I. Um, you know, how do we, you know, can we, can we somehow removed from that scan. All right, what about roofs of vehicles? Do those scan well? Yes, sir. Okay, do you take why? Just to, so we could view the, the, the spatial relation. is in place so it's a it was just faded to show that to reveal what was inside all right which was taken from your creation is absolutely inaccurate as to what that vehicle looks like say the question And is the vehicle in question, has anybody told you that the roof was taken off of it? No, sir. So I'll ask you again. That's Uh, and were you at any time ever made aware that um, that car seat had been removed and put back in? Yes, sir, I was. Okay. Did you ask them about the um, uh, whether or not the car seat was in the exact same location? I didn't question their placement of it, no, sir. Okay. And you didn't put the mannequin in the car seat? No, sir, I did not. All right. So, again, uh, for purposes of accuracy, you've got to rely on the information that's being given to you by Detective Stoddard. Yes, sir, that's correct. <clears throat> Would you agree that um, photographs of the actual vehicle would be the highest and best evidence of what that vehicle looks like? It would be one, yes, sir. Okay. Well, what if we had several dozen uh, images of the vehicle from the exterior all the way around and several dozen images of the vehicle from the interior? You could get a pretty good idea of what the exterior and interior of that vehicle look like from those images, right? It would be two-dimensional. wouldn't be. There would be no depth to it. It would not be in 3D. Right. And we couldn't take the roof off, right? With the photographs? Mm-hmm. That's correct. Okay. And we couldn't... 
Your word was maneuver or manipulate. I didn't say manipulate. Oh, those, that's my word. Okay. You can't maneuver in a photograph, right? But in your, in your creation, you can maneuver all around. That's correct. <laughs> Isn't that kind of what you can do with a video? If you have a video of the exterior of a car, you can walk all the way around it. You can video the interior, and you literally can move that video camera anywhere within the vehicle, right? That's correct. Were you made aware that there were such videos, in this particular case, of the exterior and interior of the vehicle? No, sir, I don't believe so. All right. Would that have been something that perhaps you would have wanted to, uh, to, to at least have a look at for purposes of accuracy? No, sir. Okay. <clears throat> You received some information uh, regarding the um, uh, cartoon uh, figure standing next to the car there in Defense One, and uh, essentially all of that information came from Detective Stoddard, right? Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. And I believe your testimony is Stoddard told you that he was how tall? Approximately six foot three, I believe. Approximately. Yes, sir. Okay. And you are how tall? Approximately six foot three. Okay. Because I believe that what I wrote down that you said on direct was that Stoddard said he was six two. I don't remember saying that. Okay. But you're six three. I said approximately. If I said anything, it would have been approximately six two or six three. Right. And. Um, I mean, Rick, what, what, we're, what, what we're talking about here really is, 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 is a matter of inches. Um, uh, proximity to the car, where the head is, where the arms are, the height of the individual. I mean, we're, we're talking about a matter of inches, right? Anything is a matter of inches, sir. Okay. But those inches uh, have direct bearing on the accuracy of your creation. Sure. Okay. And you have to rely on the approximation of the information you were given from Detective Stoddard. That's correct. If he's right, you're gold. If he's off a little bit, well, not so much, right? That would be a correct statement. In creating this, um, in creating these these uh, digital images, did um, did you actually get in a vehicle, or did a human person actually get inside of a vehicle to, um, to to do the scan? Which scan, sir? Any, any scan uh, from the interior of the vehicle? Yes, sir. I did. All right. <clears throat> t t tell us exactly how that works. Well, the there are two two different scanning technologies that we used. One was the what's called the terrestrial scanner, or the the Faro X330. The other is a handheld device, which is uh, captured. It's you control it. You you view it from a tablet. You control it by hand, and now you and you use that to capture the uh, what I would call more of a, a organic shapes or curved shapes. It works better for that. Um, and that's what we use to capture the scan of the interior of the vehicle. All right. Well, what, what, I, what I want to know is this. Did somebody sit in the driver's seat of that car while the scan was working? Or did somebody sit in the driver's seat of that car and use a handheld device to, to create the scan of the interior? <coughs> Two questions. Okay. The first one, did, did someone sit in the driver's seat? I sat in the driver's seat. Um, to to you to capture the the interior of the vehicle. Yes, sir. I I opened the doors. I scanned the interior of it with with the handheld device. Did I answer your question? Okay. And does the placement of the handheld device does it does it have any bearing on the accuracy of, of uh, what you're scanning? Yes, sir. It does. How so? Um, 
Are you talking about the, the actual placement of the device in general? Yes, sir. Um, it's, uh, it's relative. In other words, it has uh, and it does something called tracking, where there are uh, objects inside of the vehicle that it uses to track or maintain that uh, so the, the sequence of images that it captures. Okay. So if you uh, if you hold the uh, if you hold the device at one level, you're going to get a different image than if you hold the device maybe two inches lower. Actually, ideally, you you regularly change up the angle and location so that you capture everything everything related to this technology is line of sight. If you can't see it, then you can't you can't capture it. So regularly, you will position the device in a variety of different locations and orientations to capture the, the data. And uh, again, a video uh, from all different angles inside a car, pretty much going to do that very thing, right? No, sir. It's not, not going to capture, it's not going to capture anything in 3D space, it will just be two-dimensional. All right, and um, were you, were you told by Detective Stoddard that um, uh, What's going on here is that y'all are trying to uh, recreate what uh, Mr. Harris saw or could have seen? No, sir. Never. Okay. Well, what did he tell you we were doing then? We were just uh, we were capturing capturing the scene, uh, capturing the data. Uh, going to uh, never did we discuss what Mr. Harris would have seen. Okay. That's not my job. Well, in fact, this is the first case that you've ever had. Well, that's what was going on. You were you were uh, trying to recreate uh, sight lines of an individual. No, sir. It's not. Well, criminal, yes. Civil cases, quite a few actually. Drivers' perspectives, things of that nature. Okay. So this is the first first criminal case you've ever had where that's you're essentially trying to recreate sight lines from a person. That's correct. Did you say you've done it in a civil case? Yes, sir. Okay. How many times? I'll be conservative. I'll say five. Okay. And in those cases, did you also just sort of rely on what a detective told you um, to get as close as you could? It wasn't a detective. Typically, it was uh, an accident reconstructionist. They're always, they're always the, the, the end all. They are, they are the expert. My job is to demonstrate their opinion. <clears throat> The, um, the creation that you made from the vehicle's location at Acres Mill Square, when did, you, when did you scan that area? I believe we scanned that on the 4th of July, 2014. July 4th? Yes, sir. Okay. And did you bring, uh, or did anyone bring an actual vehicle to place it somewhere in that parking lot? No, sir. No other than the vehicles we traveled in. Okay. So what you did was you just scanned the, uh, the parking lot area. Yes, sir. Right. And then you later came back and digitally put a vehicle in the parking lot. Yes, sir. That's true. Okay. And... How did you know exactly where to put the vehicle in the parking lot of Acres Mill Square? I placed it within the paint marks that were still on the asphalt. Okay. And then again verified with Detective Stoddard. Okay. Was he with you uh, at the time of the job where y'all working together? Uh, was he assisting you in creating this? Assisting in creating what? In creating the, the digital creation that you made. I made it, I would. I positioned the vehicles, and then we met, and I showed him what it looked like. Okay. Were you given any photographs? I don't recall. Okay. Um, were you ever made aware that there were numerous um, measurements that were taken of the exterior and interior of the vehicle? I don't believe I was. All right. Did you ever ask for those? No, sir. Okay.
we asked to create a panoramic image for the interior of that vehicle. Yes, sir. You can create a panoramic image from any scan data. I believe I made Detective Stoddard and Mr. Evans aware that we could do that. All right. Do you know what a fisheye view is? I do. What is a fisheye view? A fisheye view is where you use what's called a fisheye lens, which is effectively an asymmetrical lens that produces a distorted, also known as a fisheye image. Yes, sir. In any of the digital creation that you made, was any sort of fisheye technology or anything akin to fisheye used? No, sir. Okay. Tell us about the panoramic image. You would agree that that is not how the human eye observes a landscape or anything in front of it, right? I think that's true. It's just a panoramic image. Okay. And what was the purpose in creating panoramic images? Why were you told to do that? Do you know? Just so that there would be a viewpoint or a way to visualize what I guess what you could see from that particular vantage point. All right. Well, in your report on page 12, do you have your report with you? I do. I don't think it will be long, Judge. I think a couple of minutes are probably going to cover everything. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
It's, it's just what is captured. Sure. If you could spin around, if you could spin around and you could place your head in the same location, could you see uh, the back side of that seat? I would imagine you could. All right. So I've got a couple of questions for you then. Isn't it possible to just take a picture with a camera from outside the car or set up a camera inside the car to take the exact same photograph to see that image? You, well, the only way you'd get that same image is if you used a panoramic camera. Okay. It's not the exact same. And you agree a panoramic camera in this panoramic view is, is not what the human eye can see. Okay. Well, if it's line of sight, so if you're talking about what is visible in that image, uh, for instance, the steering wheel, the door handles, those things, from that particular point in 3D space, that that point is visible from that location. I'm not telling you what I'm not telling you what anyone saw. I'm just telling you if you look at that image. All right. So what you have in your report is is that this image shows the approximate view from the driver's Mr. Harris's approximate eye level. Yes. Okay. So did anybody give you any information that Mr. Harris was sitting where the steering wheel was and he was looking at the back of his seat? Did anybody give you that information for you to create that panoramic uh, angle and that panoramic view? No, sir. So our, would, would you suggest that I only do half of an image? or I would suggest that what you want to um, capture is what's accurate. Questions and answers. Nobody told you that information that he was uh, anyone's <coughs> eye level was where the steering wheel was looking at the driver's seat, did they? No, sir. Okay. So you would agree that this image is not accurate of anything that Mr. Harris could have seen. Looking forward, if you look at the panoramic image, if you position it, you position it facing forward toward the seat, you would see that those same objects, if you were sitting facing that direction. Okay. So if someone was sitting facing the direction where they were looking at the driver's seat, but they were in the place of the steering wheel, this is what they would see. If they were looking at the driver's seat, looking, uh, no, it's actually closer to the headrest than that. Okay. And you received no information that Mr. Harris was ever in a position where he was looking at the seating part of the driver's seat? I did not. I'll ask you again. This is not accurate of any information that you received that Mr. Harris was in a position to ever have this view. I'm not sure how to answer that. It's, it's, it's a panoramic image. Uh, I'm asking as simple as possible. From sitting in the driver's seat, could Mr. Harris have had that very view that you that you got depicted there? You could see a portion of that view. Yeah. Would you like to see? Oh, I can see it. Thank you. I think that's all I've got. Unfortunately, a little longer than I expected based on that cross examination. I need to explore some things. Sir, sure. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 35. Well, actually, I'll try to keep it at 30. No, that's not what I'm, what I'm asking. Um, let's write for lunch until 1 15. All right. Um, this court stands in recess.